whole point whole point of this is I am just putting this on to help you think a little bit about what the pre-scene contains so that you're able to maybe look at it from a different perspective. But for me to understand, you've got to you've got to communicate with me. Hi, Sean. Drupa here. Hello, Drupa. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. How can I help you? No, just just a thought on this pre scene when it, when it first came out, I felt like oh no, because football is something not not something I obviously enjoy. <laughs> you know, it's not my my type. <laughs> so it was a bit bit. I was in panic, but I think after, you know, listening to few people doing the SWOT analysis and going through the pre-mock, it's a little bit better now. <laughs> Just need to treat it as a business rather than a football, really. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Be, yeah. Just when you're listening to other people going through it, just just be careful because there are a lot of people um, out there who, you know, if, I, I would say for people who are giving analysis, put their name into the ACCA website. And if articles and videos are not there produced by them, I, I just, I would be a bit careful taking too much notice of what they say. I see. Yeah. Yeah. You, you kind of want to make sure that you get your information from ACCA approved sources. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people there who just seem to like the sound of their own voice or something. or So just be, just be a little careful because some of the things I've seen there, I've just thought, oh, my goodness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you know, it's, it's actually, it's more harm than help. So, yeah, just, just be careful on that. Don't, yeah, don't definitely. become too obsessed. Is yeah, what official resource reading is, is best, which is what um, I've been doing, yeah. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. Great, great, great. All right. Any so thank you for that. That's good. Good to hear your kind of perspective on things. Any any comments from anyone else on the case study before I I get stuck in? No. Okay. Okay. So just just maybe you can tell me in the chat box what what are you here for if we are not if you haven't got any questions. Hi, Chef. Bridget here. It's not I don't have any questions. That's there is a lot. Um, of information in, in that document. So I'm more interested to, to, to listen to your thoughts and, and ask questions. Okay, okay. Just okay. I felt it was a bit overwhelming the length of the document, to be honest. And oh. and the number of information, you know, in... in okay. In so a bit overwhelmed with the length of it. I mean, to be honest, yeah. it is a similar length to previous pre-seen information. How are we doing time-wise? Have we got to... Sorry, just let me just check the time I've got on my... Yeah. You know what? I'm going to start. And please, please, um, you know, I'm doing this to help you. Uh, I can't read your mind. If you've got any questions, just come off mic and we'll have a chat. If you have to leave for whatever reason, I've got a recording of this and I will kind of render the recording and, and put it on a YouTube channel. So hopefully that helps you. So welcome, welcome to this evening. The The point of this evening is to go through the March 2024 pre-seen information and digest it to see if there's anything in there that we're not clear on. If there's anything in there we might want to delve a little bit deeper into. Um, yeah, and so let's let's start. I am going to share a screen with you. Bear with me one moment. Uh, which screen I'm going to share? I'm going to share that one. And then I'm going to put this into full mode. We're going to do a slideshow. So what what are you able to see? Just let me know. Someone come off mic. What can you see on the screen? And just your name. <laughs> just my name? Yeah. Nothing uh, else? I can see ACCA SPL Prison Material. March. Thank you very <laughs> much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Right. So I know I know that you can see what I'm hoping you can see. So this is done in conjunction with a PQ magazine. I'm not sure if you're familiar with PQ magazine, but they do a great job for accountancy students around the world. Um, you can sign up for PQ magazine 
through this um, link. And yeah, they give give lots of stuff. The editor is very much a student champion, and I'd encourage you to have a look at it. In terms of the pre-scene, uh, what is the purpose of the pre-scene? Well, I know that you've listened to lots of different people's view of the pre-scene. If you know nothing about me and you've just stumbled across this, I work with the ACCA as their expert. Quite a few people say that, but put my name into the ACCA website, put it into Student Accountant, put it into the ACCA app, the YouTube channel. You'll find lots of videos the ACCA have asked me to record on SBL, lots of question debriefs, all of that. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of confidence in what I'm saying. If you look at how to analyze the pre scene material, the ACCA uh, webinar on that, again, that's me presenting that webinar. So um, hopefully that is giving you a little bit of confidence in what I'm going to say. What I want to share with you is not my words, but the words of the examining team. And this is what they see the pre-scene to be. Basically, the SBL exam is being introduced as a practical workplace-based exam where you act as a strategic leader. Originally, it was up to maybe 16, 17 pages long. So it was pretty big. And I think there was an update from September 2023, whereby the exam or some of the information in the exam was going to be presented via some pre c material. Yep. So the whole point of providing students with pre c is just to enable them to become comfortable with the topic, to be clear on any terminology that's being used. But what it's not, it is definitely not something to say, hey, this is what an exam question is going to be on. Now, you might have heard that from quite a few people. And to be honest, I, you know, I specialize in SBL, only SBL uh, with students for the ACCA. So, you know, that's that's all I do with regards to students. Whereas a lot of tutors, they will teach degrees, MBAs, SEMA, ICAW, SIPFA, and on, on some of the other professional examination bodies, SEMA, just let me add someone coming in, SEMA, ICAW, the pre c material which they give is, is pretty much a big flag for what questions are to be asked. That is not the point. That is not the point of the ACCA material. It is very different. And I think sometimes some tutors get a little bit confused, but, you, you know, I... I sit down with the examining team, I talk to them and with the education team. And that is definitely the message the ACCA have told me to pass on to everyone. Yep. So don't see it as a question spotting exercise. For example, if I was living in landlocked Mongolia, I might not know, although it might seem strange to you, what a yacht is. Okay because you don't have yachts in the middle of Mongolia because there is not really any water. So if a student that one of the specimen papers was about Yex Marine, about a yacht company, and it would be you know useful if that person who might speak English as a third language can actually, you know, maybe familiarize themselves with a yacht. So that is what a pre-scene is set up to do. OK, to give a background so that you contextualize your answers. And I just want to maybe embellish a little bit of that background that the pre scene has provided. All righty. Do you have any questions on what I have said so far? No. Um, oh. Would you concentrate on question practice then rather than analyzing the pre scene? What would you prioritize? Uh, I would prioritize consolidating my knowledge in the next two weeks and make it, you know, if you've done mock exams and got feedback and the, and the like on them, you know, the feedback that you've been given, where do you need to improve, that kind of thing. If you haven't been giving any feedback, if you go into my YouTube channel, there's a few recordings I've done for the ACCA where I've taken apart questions. Have a look at that to help, but it's good to challenge yourself to do a mock, not on Word, not on Excel, but on the CBE platform, which is a bit clunky, but that's what your exam is on. So I, I do, I make my students do all my mocks on the CBE platform. It's a bit of a pain, but actually it's what the exam is on. So some other big, well, hardly anyone does it. Most people do it on a bit of software that isn't ACCA software and it runs a lot more smoothly. 
It almost runs like Word and Excel. The ACCA platform doesn't run like Word and Excel, and it's the ACCA platform where you're doing your exam. So I would I would have familiarity with the platform, understand slide functionality, understand how the word processing works, and understand how the spreadsheet works. Yeah, because it's a bit clunky. So make sure you're really up to speed on that. And then, yeah, just the, the, the you know, you are asked on SBL to operate at a, a top level, a strategic level. You're not going to get involved in the minutiae, in, in, you know, the little bits. So you need to have a top level perspective, I would suggest. Does that, does that answer your question? I think it does. I'll try and keep up with the chat bot, but I'm, I'm quite far away here. It's best if you just come off mic. Yeah. Okay, Becky. In fact, that's no problem. Yeah. I've, I've also, because I'm presenting, I've suddenly lost all your thumbs up and everything else. And I can't see anyone doing that. So please just come off mic. Maybe I could share a different screen, but hey, just come off mic. It's a lot easier and quicker. Okay. So that's the aim of the pre-scene. <clears throat> what have we got? Well, we've got a football club. Yep. Uh, it gives you information where it gets its cash from. Yep. If, I'll, I'll look at the figures a little bit later. But in terms of its cash, most of its cash or the vast majority of its cash comes from TV. Yeah. And that's pretty much reflective of football in the UK. Yeah. The, the richest league in the world is the English Premier League. And it's basically the richest league as a result of TV money. I mean, there is a other income, but the, the big, big income comes from match day. In terms of where they spend their money, uh, well, uh, salaries of players are the big one, really. And that's that's a big deal. Uh, the others, yeah, they spend a bit, but not too much. Again, I know we're all accountants and we want to look at the accounting angle, but we're, we're doing strategic business leader. Yeah. If I am a strategic business leader, I am not sweating the financial accounts. Yeah. So don't get too involved in, you know, EBITDA or whatever, just to understand the direction of travel of it. But if you're getting into the minutiae of it, I have some junior accountant to do that for me as a strategic business leader. I don't do it myself. And your job, uh, your role is acting as a strategic business leader often. But what happens with a football player, they see it as an asset. And in the same way, we don't incur the cost of an asset in the year we buy it, but we may be right off I don't know, a car over three years, you would write off a player that you purchase over the term of their contract. Yeah. So, yeah, it's all gone crazy. Football players have become ridiculously expensive. I remember when, you know, the first million pound player happened. I think it was Trevor Francis back in the kind of, I mean, you know, you couldn't, no player would sell for, yeah, any decent player would be tens and tens of millions these days, mainly because of all the money in the game from TV. OK, so understand, are you clear on the income and expenditure? Is that OK? OK, OK, that's good. That's good if you're all clear on that. And no, understand about the financial fair play rules. Yeah. So what this it's probably important to understand why do we have financial fair play? Well, the English Premier League, probably most famous, was Roman Abramovich. So Roman Abramovich was a Russian, well, a guy that benefited from the collapse of Russia and made lots of money out of the people of Russia from various uh, state assets. And he brought his money to the UK. And Chelsea was an OK football club, but he put billions into it and kind of bought himself to win the championship, you could argue. And basically, some people felt that uh, the ability to buy your way into a Premier League was not really in the spirit of the game. So to stop that happening, there's something called a financial fair play rule. Yep. Where you basically is uh, there's a formula that it explains in the pre scene how to measure it. And if you drop below a certain threshold, potentially you could get kicked out of the league. So, or, you know, that to me, if you're doing a risk assessment and say, oh, it's 20% kick, risk, we get kicked. If you get kicked out, you're dead. So, you know, that that's not a risk you would even consider. 
Yeah, because if you if you fall foul of it, you'll get kicked out of the league. All of the income that you currently get from TV will no longer because the income from lower leagues is minuscule compared to the income you get from the big league. So, you know, if you were looking at risk and there was some suggestion with regards to maybe, you know, falling foul of the financial fair play regulations, you, you just, you know, you wouldn't take that risk. All righty. Are you happy with that? Okay. In terms of risks, if you read the pre-scene, there's a whole list of risks you can go to. I would suggest you become familiar with them and you're happy with them. Because um, it's like in the prison. There's sorry. what, sorry? Go on. No, no, that's fine. Go on. Yeah, no, because in the prison, you see there is like a slight difference. They go in the same direction, but they're, they're not the same. So what is not included in one and the other? What makes the difference? Just repeat that again, sorry. The, what, the, the, what's the same? The uh, EBITDA, the operating profit and the relevant earnings. What's the difference between the two calculations? Because it looks quite similar. but No, it's, it's, completely, it's completely different. If All you look right. at it, 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 I don't know whether you've managed to get a chance to read it, but it, it's not EBITDA. It, it's a formula. If I just go back, it's a formula there where relevant income um, is where well we're looking at relevant earnings yep yeah. and and mm -hmm. i think it, it's to it's to make sure that it so it, it actually says they're not identical to accounting profits yeah yeah but so what's just, the main difference between the two um well That's one the the financial fair play regulations are designed to stop people like roman abramovich just buying their way into a football club so if you were a big football club, you, you know, you might have quite high ticket sales and high ticket TV revenue and, you know, advertising stuff. But that's, you, you know, that's not the same for everyone. In the UK, someone like Manchester United would probably be the richest club. Yeah, but they, they, they've got a history. So to buy Manchester United, it would cost you billions. I mean, you don't, don't get too involved in the small stuff. Just understand that... The financial fair play regulations, if breached, are absolutely death for a football club. Okay, thanks for clarifying. Thanks so no, much. no, that's all right. That's all right. Just uh, butt in. Risks are given. Just make sure you're comfortable with the risks. Are, were there any of the risks that are, you, the, the terminology used not, not clear to you? No? Okay, okay. Uh, other things to pick on and potential, you know, things that you're probably going to get in a question, but it's not specific to football, would be the fact that the stadium of AT has a maximum capacity of 38,000. And, you know, the other stadiums are much bigger with the biggest stadium having a capacity of 73,000. So obviously that enables the uh, football club with big stadiums to generate more match day income. But I, I would also, I'd be sceptical and think, well, is the future of football match day income? You know, when we look at the accounts, we see match day income is half what TV revenue is. Yeah. So maybe, maybe we, you know, there's a kind of a likelihood that we might expand the stadium and we might, but I think, you know, if we did expand the stadium and it cost us an absolute fortune, is that the best use of our spend or should we be maybe trying to develop you know better tv deals so that that was something that struck out to me it talks about kpis and make sure you're familiar with them uh, we may have to generate some kpis as well from when it talks about values and missions yeah so i'll come back to that it talks about it it says they think they're okay well the whole loads of supporters information there's a big part of your syllabus about technology Yep. So there's two issues there. There's uh, potential cyber crime, cyber attacks, ransomware attacks. So, you know, how would we prevent as a football club being attacked with ransomware? And also, what about the data held uh, of all of our season ticket holders and customers? That data has to comply with various data compliance rules. So, you know, they're, they're pretty big issues. You should be fully familiar with that. Because, you know, that's that's again, it's a big fine or it's a loss of a lot of money if you got some ransomware. Yeah. So that's an issue. The stadium is old. 
It's inefficient. They talk about being green. I think it's impossible to be green in a knackered old stadium. Yeah. So, and also the running costs of a knackered old stadium are probably pretty high. Yeah. So some of what they currently have goes against their mission. They had they gave a mission of transparency, safeguarding, community, players' conduct. Could you develop KPIs for each of those values? You might be asked to. Yeah. Uh, oh, well, what, give me a pro forma. No, it doesn't work like that. You need to think about what you might do. If I gave you the accounts of Tesco, Marks and Spencers, Unilever, Diageo, Procter & Gamble, and asked you to look at how they kind of dealt with something like integrated reporting or, or their values and how they measured them, they'd all measure them slightly different. Yeah, they all have a similar direction of travel. But what's important that, that you can say something and you can justify it and you can contextualize it in the context of the football club. So, for example, they talk about the environment. And if you said CO2 per square meter, it's like, what are you talking about? It's asking about you talking about a performance measure in a football club. Uh, oh, how, what is the CO2? You might think about that and then you might say, oh, well, it might be uh, the CO2 consumed traveling to away games. So in the UK, we have got football teams now sometimes traveling by train rather than by private plane. Yeah, obviously a, a much greener way of traveling. Yeah, that kind of thing. Do they use biofuel in their lawnmowers cutting their pitch? Just you know, try to contextualize it it, it, like a football club. All righty. So think about that. Uh, there's something on the revenue. The interesting thing on the revenue is if you look at total revenue, it starts at 315 and goes up to 340. I don't know whether you noticed that. So the, the rise year on year is, is tiny. You know, it's 3% or something. It's nothing, 2%. It's nothing at all because it doesn't start at zero. So just watch out for that. It looks quite significant growth from 20 uh, kind of X1 uh, to th uh, 2023. It's not really. And then the revenue by type demonstrates that the television revenue is, you know, double the match day revenue. Yeah. So that's where the money is. Uh, yep. Yeah. So that's that's kind of what we want to be focusing on as opposed to uh, making more money from match day re revenue is probably difficult to, not so impossible. So, so Sean, you are saying the television revenue is not directly connected with how many people attend our no. match or whatever. No. Television revenue is watching s sort of sky television. So wherever you live in the world where I travel a lot and wherever I travel, I can always watch an English football match. That English football match normally has to be viewed on a cable TV channel. For you to view a cable TV channel, you normally have to pay a subscription. Right. So in the UK, to subscribe to Sky Sports probably costs you £50 a month. Right. But does it does it matter if our team goes all the way to the top of the league or like if it, if it if it falls through in between because they don't qualify or whatever reason? Does um, it affect the revenue? Uh, no, that is related to prize money. Right. OK. Yeah. So probably the most popular team in the UK would be Manchester United. They would probably have the biggest viewing figures for TV revenue. But Manchester United or maybe sixth or seventh in the table right okay so yeah. you, you, even if people are watching somebody else's so if i'm not a fan of manchester united and if the match is for manchester united how will other team makes money on it i'm just trying to understand well there'll be a tv contract that will be split and the way that i mean it it you know to be honest i'm giving you real life here we we're, we're mm. not really supposed to go to real life we're supposed yeah. to deal with the information which we're given in the scenario mm. um so the money they get from broadcast is much higher than the money they get from match day i see so match day will be tickets that but you would also you could add to match day it's not that easy to apportion but you're likely to sell a bit more in the retail shop and maybe you're going to sell food and drink on match day so some of the retail revenue there added you know if you added 52 to 64 that mm. puts you close to the television revenue 
Mm, but it, mm. but it, it's not clear how that retail revenue is split, how much comes on match day and how much comes on people just buying shirts and stuff. Even online, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah, so it's not that clear. But that's what the exam is always set up to do so it can turn about into a different way. Yeah, depending on how the exhibit layout, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, thank you. All righty. Any other questions on that? Okay. EBITDA and relevant earnings, this does start at zero. Yeah. So the steps are, you know, kind of more believable. So we can see EBITDA drops from 60 to kind of 40-ish to kind of 25-ish, 26-ish. So that's it's dropped quite a bit. It's it's almost dropped a hundred percent. Yeah. Well, it's it's yeah, you know what I'm saying. Um relevant earnings, the direction of travel is poor there as well. If that keeps happening, the relevant earnings are the way in which they calculate financial fair play rules. Um, it's not heading in the right direction, that. And and that's a potential real worry if you know those relevant earnings get hurt further. That's a worry. Okay. Um, any questions on any of that? Okay. So I'm, this webinar is not about question spotting, but in the context of the scenario that you've been given, what typically uh, would happen maybe more in a football business than might happen in a, an airline business? I mean, to be honest, all businesses are subjected to similar risks, but corporate governance is definitely there. And you should appreciate, is corporate governance relevant to this business? Yes or no? Very much so. Very much so. Why? Because the public is very interested and the transparency and the fair play rules call for... They right. are, but but what, what, what power do the public have? Well, they're the source of revenue. Um, so do you think they'd stop going to football? There's a key corporate governance thing you should have spotted in the pre c material that makes the, the CEO who is a family member. Okay, so what what if it's a, what's the I you know, know. nobody's controlling him for his decision. Okay, but who's controlling the company? There's any two non executive directors. So the, the people who are in charge of the company are two non executive directors. I'm throwing it back at you. Come on. I want you to get your head around this. And there's the chairman as well. The chairman. Does he have any say? I'd say the CEO has the most say. Why? Because he's the owner. I think the okay. chairman. So, so he's the owner. So the, there's no shareholders. His family. Okay. So, so do you need corporate governance in a family company? Probably not. Well, there's an argument you might want it, but that is the absolute crucial thing of this mm. pre-C material. And if, if no one's brought that up on any other conversation, well, you know, judge their interpretation on that. The whole point of corporate governance is the fact that you have agency theory, which you will know from your studies of SPL. And what agency theory is about is in a company owned by shareholders, shareholders own the company, but they are not the managers of the company. The managers manage the company as agents of the shareholders. So they manage things on their behalf. And what the problem is, is that managers might try to, you know, make a bit more money for themselves or they make rubbish decisions. And to be honest, if they make rubbish decisions, they still get paid a salary, whereas the share price goes right down. So what we have is we have corporate governance where we have committees of non-executive directors. We have, you know, AGMs, we have rotation of directors and we have NEDs dominating executives all to protect the interests of the owners. But in a family company, the person that owns the company and the person that manages the company is the same person. So if the manager screws up, the company loses money and the family lose money. So there's not such a need to have corporate governance in a family business because the owners and the managers are the same. That's, that's a crucial point on corporate governance and family companies. Yeah. Any, anything you want to say on that? 
So corporate governance, you should understand in quite a bit of, you know, detail, the difference between family business and corporate governance and a shareholder owned company and corporate governance. But where there's ambiguity is it talks about the family having the, you know, the major interest. So does that mean they've got 51% or does it mean they've got 99%? I don't know. The other thing you would say in favor of corporate governance, though, is having good corporate governance in a business is a good thing. Why? Because it gives confidence for investors. It gives confidence for banks. It pretty by having committees and having NEDs, you're going to get a better run company. A better run company like that is going to be more attractive to, you know, seen to executives who want to work there because it's not run by some idiot, you know, dominant entrepreneur. It's a proper business. Yeah. So there's a lot, you know, corporate governance is a good way to run a company. It is a, a must way to run a company. It's not a rule, but the, it's a, you know, in the UK, we don't have rules. We have principles, but uh, I don't think shareholders would be very keen to invest in any company where they, they could buy shares in if the corporate governance was not following the guidelines. Whereas they can't invest in a family company because the shares are not in the public domain. That's a key, key thing to understand. Happy? Okay, okay, let's move on. IT, you've got to understand about cybersecurity. Read the articles on the ACCA website. There are lots of them just to get your head around all of that. There could be a scandal. There could be various scandals. I mean, you know, even this week, the Brazilian and former Barcelona player has just been jailed for five years for sexual assault. That happened about, well, it happened about three or four years ago at Manchester United. The player was sent off to Spain. He wasn't charged in the end. But it's like, phew, what do we do with a player like that? Yeah. Scandals of gambling, scandals of drug taking. There was a, a paedophile football coach grooming all boys in a football academy. Probably a bit deep for the ACCA, that one. But my point is, these things have happened in real life. Maybe the examiner, when writing, may have been influenced by some of that. Okay. So how do you deal with it? So... I, yeah, I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. But you might be asked to build build a bigger stadium. So you'll be asked to evaluate an investment. If you're evaluating an investment, don't forget on SBL, you know, all of the figure, cat. you're going to be asked to use numbers, not calculate them. Yeah, applied skills and the basic level of ACCA ask you to do sums. Chief strategic business leaders don't do sums. They have minions or they have computers that do sums for them. Yeah. So it's unlikely you're going to have to do many sums, but you are going to have to evaluate and interpret the sums. Yeah. So if there's an investment proposal and it says, you know, the stadium capacity is going to double and we're going to get loads of money. It's like, really? You know, why? Where? What evidence do you have to back this up? How much money are we going to get? How much is it going to cost? When you have a proposal on the table, is it suitable, feasible, acceptable? Make sure you're fully familiar with is it suitable, feasible, acceptable. If you're not, I've written an article on it. Go on to the ACCA SBL technical articles, strategic planning process part one, strategic planning process part two. I explain it all in those articles. Yeah. So have a look at that. They might float. They might need to get some cash. Football clubs have floated. Is the corporate governance as it presently stands appropriate? Go on, question there. Are you talking about the stadium just now? May I? There is one fact there that shown that the land, the land, the football club own a land that which is adjacent to the stadium, but was currently leased to the government bodies. So, is there any any comment from you about how the land that leads to government may affect the football club if there is the case that the football club want to expand the stadium using the land? Well, they, they'd have to, they own the land. The football club own the stadium and the land near the stadium and they, they rent out some of that land to the local government. So maybe they have a park or they have a bus station or, or something like that. Um, so they would have to 
you know, if they were thinking of expanding, they've got a bit of extra room to make the stadium bigger. Um, so they've got that. The only issue is maybe it depends on the lease. We don't know what the lease says. But if you were extending or you were building a new one, where are they going to play if we knock the stadium down? They'd have to find somewhere else to play. And it's probably going to take two or three years to build a new stadium. Uh, and also the, the current stadium is in an area of high congestion. And, you, you know, the locals, so the stakeholders, the local community are kind of impacted by that. So you'd have to consider the stakeholders and their power and interest. Um, you'd have to consider the the contract that they have with the local government. But it, but it is possible. But it sounds like the whole stadium is knackered. So I don't think you could repair it. You know, it wouldn't fulfill its green. You'd probably have to knock it down and build a new one, which would take some time and would cause lots of disruption. So what has happened in real life? Everton who actually were going to get almost relegated. It's still going on, the kind of courts and appeals, but they built a brand new stadium, yep, in an area where they could, you know, make it super efficient and near public transport. Manchester United extended their stadium. Newcastle United extended their stadium. But I think they're kind of looking now and thinking, mm, maybe we should build a new one. Manchester United definitely, now they've got a new injection of money, are thinking of building a new stadium somewhere else. But which is right and wrong? You have to evaluate that and give your argument. It's not about having a right and wrong answer. It's about demonstrating you're able to consider and look at the suitability, feasibility and acceptability. Thank you for your touch, Sean. Really helping. No, no that's all right. That's all right. Uh, if they break the financial fair play regulations, that's, oof, that, as I say, that's death. So anything that even gets uh, a, a slight risk of breaking that is something you would consider to be very high risk, high impact, uh, uh, you, you, you know, massive impact. So you'd, you'd need to be, you know, you, you wouldn't take that lightly is what I'm saying. All righty. Some people have sent me questions that couldn't turn up. Um, and some of these people have done mocks with me and stuff like that. I mean, if you got a mock result below 50, how can I get above 50? Well, if you've got feedback on a mock, you should digest the feedback. You I, On my mocks, I create quite long videos explaining what, what, how you could have got an answer, what's good, what's bad, et cetera, et cetera. You need to digest all that feedback and reflect where could you change things a little bit? But yes, you need to get 50 or more on the day of the exam and not before. So of course you can do well in your exam. How can you develop points further? That's a major problem with a lot of students. They seem to think they get two marks a point. You don't. You, you get a mark if you take the information and the ACCA described this as synthesizing information, which means you take the information and interpret it your way and give your opinion on it. You'll get one mark for that. If you then, having made that point, start talking about the consequences of what you've just said or why you've just said it, like the so what, the why, and you explain it in the context of the scenario, then you could get two marks. Yeah, but a lot of people sometimes just copy and paste, get no marks for that. Yep. So you must be thinking on, on a point that you've already made your own opinion on. Having made that, think about the consequence, think about the so what, think about the why, and that will move your point from maybe one mark to two. But you don't get awarded two marks for a point. Okay. If anyone's told you that, they've never marked an ACCA exam in their life. Yeah. Can answer plans be left on the word processor? I would say yes, most definitely. <clears throat> yep, because if you put it in the scratch pad, that doesn't get marked. If you are a borderline answer, so anyone over 45 will get their script reviewed uh, by a couple of people. And so when you get 49, it has been looked at a lot and you just haven't given enough information. But if you, if you do get it reviewed and you have a plan, examining team will sometimes look at plans to see whether you're worthy of being bumped up. John, sorry, what do you mean by an answer plan as in where you've just kind of bullet pointed what you're, what you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 you know, I, if I was answering an SBL question, I would find it absolutely impossible to answer an SBL question without a plan. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you could do your bullet points. And then the beauty of being able to type your questions is that those bullet points could become subheadings and you can flesh it out. 
so what a plan is going to do for you, a plan is going to, you know, just check that you've got enough to say to get over the pass threshold for the mark allocation. It, it's just going to keep you, you know, on, in the right direction. So, yeah, that's what I mean by a plan. But also remember, a plan doesn't need to be beautiful. A plan is for you to help you structure a good answer. Yeah. But I would, I would definitely, and I would just title it plan and then answer, title it answer, just to help the marker. It's really important you help the marker. Time strategy to finish on time. Uh, yeah, really important, that one. I, uh, very, I think I've got a video on my YouTube channel on this. I've just recorded a video for the ACCA on this. But in a nutshell, you've got 80 technical marks. You've got 20 professional skills marks. Yep. You've got uh, a three hour, 15 minute exam, which is 195 minutes. I would say you're probably going to be having to spend maybe 35 minutes to read and plan your answer. Yeah. So that means you take 35 minutes off 195, you get 160 minutes. You divide that by the technical marks of 80 because the professional skills marks take no time to require to acquire. So 160 divided by 80 gives me two minutes a mark. So that would be my time guidance. So if it's a, an eight mark question, I'm starting at a time I'm finishing 16 minutes later. Time is a big killer on SPL. You've got to manage it. Yeah, it's really important. And the other thing to remember is the first 50% of your answer is easier to acquire than the latter 50%. So what a lot of students do is sometimes they spend far too long on question one. Yeah. Which, to be honest, lets them not be able to answer most of question three. So they, they might get 60% on question one. So say they get, I don't know, maybe 20 out of 30 on question one pretty good. They do pretty well in question two as well. They get 20 out of 30 on question two, but they've actually spent about three hours doing that. And then they do a really rushed panicky answer to question three and they get four marks and they fail with 44. Whereas they probably got, you know, 15, 16 of the marks well within the time. And had they got kind of, you know, 16, 17, 16, 17, 16, 17, they would have passed their paper. Does, does that make sense, the way I've described that? Yeah. yeah. Can okay. I just check the, the professional skills that you mentioned? Say my answer was completely and utterly wrong, but I set it out perfectly and addressed it perfectly and worded it correctly. It's just the co content is incorrect. Would I still get marks? You, you would get some marks, but it's important when it says professional skills marks are for skepticism. You don't just stop reading there. It will then say for skepticism in describing and blah, 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 blah. So make sure you follow that. Um, that's important. There's no, I mean, the professional skills marks are the kind of lens through which you develop your answer. So again, if you're planning, you'll be making sure that your answers have a spin on them relevant to the professional skills mark that's been assessed. So you might be being asked to be sceptical so you don't take everything at face value and you question some of the, the figures and the assumptions. You might be being asked to, to use commercial acumen so you'll show that mm, I'm not sure it's really worth spending that when the return is that, when actually the growth is over there. That's that's what the professional skills marks are meant and are designed to make you do. But they're, they, they're not mutually exclusive. They tend to be, you know, feed off each other. It, it has been, I kind of, when the SBL was launched, I did all the, the training on it around the world. And a lot of people said, oh, I'm just going to go for the technical marks. And it was like, well, they don't exist in isolation. They 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 are not mutually exclusive. They complement each other. Does that Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And the other one, if the professional skills marks are for communication, it's not, you're not, professional skills marks are not two from date or report format. I mean, you will probably get a mark for that because that's professional. If you're asked to do a report and you don't do a report, that's not professional. Yeah. But all the marks are not for the format. They're for the tone, the style, the emphasis. Yeah. The wording. That's what they're for. So, you know, again, there's articles on the ACCA website about that. You want to digest and just make sure you're happy.
I think I've created a video on that. There's certainly a video I created for the ACCA on my YouTube channel on that. Yeah, so so digest those. The, the key thing, though, if it asks you for slide format, first of all, have you been on the CPE platform and familiarize yourself with slide format? I hope you have, because if you haven't, it's a bit like taking your driving test and getting in a car that you're doing your test in for the first time on the day of the test. That would be mad. So you've done that. But if it asks for slide format and the professional skills marks for communication and you don't do slides, you lose all of the professional skills marks there because you failed to communicate completely yeah and if you did that for me in the workplace you know i'm doing a big presentation ask you to do slides and you didn't and i'm standing up in front of hundreds of people and you haven't done any slides i wouldn't find that very professional yeah so always link it back to the workplace so what lessons have i learned from my mock well the lessons i mean I, I, my students do lots of mocks they get lots of marked homework and you know they start off pretty bad and they get better on their journey um Many of the things mentioned in the uh, SBL examiner's report and not just the September 23 one, go back. You, you'll soon start seeing it's exactly the same stuff every time going back uh, once you've read about three or four of them. But but read the examiner's reports because they reflect a lot of that. Uh, read my pre seam review material in addition to what I've said to you, how to interpret it. So that's that that's on the ACCA YouTube channel. Uh, in terms of what people did in September 2023, they answered all three tasks. However, that would suggest to me, yeah, their time management wasn't bad, but this was evidenced uh, when you know marking was taking place. Some people were like just like regurgitate a load of theory. There are no marks for theory. If you started to talk to me about Porter's five forces in the workplace, I'm like, who's Porter? You know, you, you're supposed to, it's a workplace practical exam. Yep. Talking about theory, I think you're some kind of weirdo. However, the theory gives us a great catalyst, a great structure, which we use in our plan to help catalyze a really good answer. That's how we use the theory, but we don't reveal our sources. Yep. Also, the plan is for you, as I said before, uh, people, I see some papers where, you know, they're using about seven different fonts and different font sizes. It takes forever. You haven't got time to do that in the SPL exam. So just, you know, be professional, make it neat, but not too elaborate. The way in which it's marked is the markers will now just mark one question many, many times. They will know everything about that question inside out. If you think you're going to hoodwink the marker by repeating a point, no, you're not. You're just going to waste time repeating that point. And that time could have been spent getting a relevant mark worthy point on the next question. But th this is pretty common behavioral mistakes. Yeah. What else was the cause of failure in my mocks and in previous exams that have been taken? People not developing their points. People telling me that they why am I not getting two marks a point? Well, I'm not even giving you one mark for that because all you've done is copy and paste out of the scenario. You've not even made a point. But if you're not developing your answer with the so what and the why, or you're just kind of regurgitating stuff that is not contextualized, in this case with a football club or in September with a, um, a, a low-cost airline or in December with a software company, you're not going to get the marks. Yeah? So, so what you know, consequence, why? Um, just generic, non-applied um, points. Try to try to picture it. Try to, it's a football club. Don't all oh, hate football. Okay, not, you know, but it, it's a sport. Think of another sport, football, tennis. It's all fairly similar, the challenges and issues that they have. But try, try to see it in real life. Yep, it will help you come up with more points. Basically, not taking on board all the information. You should be fully conversant with the stuff in the pre-scene. So you should be familiar. You know, don't start suggesting that things that are good when they completely contravene missions and values which have been given to you in the pre-scene or completely, you know, blow out of the water their financial fair play regulations. Yeah. So be careful. Be you, You're expected to have good knowledge of that. And you need to digest information given on the exam day. So picture it. What does the story tell? Yeah. 
this is something that everyone taking exams suffered uh, or suffers because we're a bit stressed. Yeah. And when we're stressed, our body thinks we're going to get attacked by a woolly mammoth and secretes a chemical in our body called cortisol. OK, we we have a different type of stress, which is, you know, about an exam. So it makes us ready to flight or fight so we can either hit the woolly mammoth or we can run away from it. Yeah. But you're sat in a chair and what that chemical does, it floods your brain and hijacks your brain and makes you see things that aren't there. Yeah. So you need to understand that's going to happen and you need to have a strategy of dealing with it. So my strategy of dealing with that is I see a requirement. I read it once. I read it again. And then I step out of that mindset. I do a brainstorm on what I think the key issues are in this area. I think about how many marks are available. So ooh, let me get a couple more points, a couple more points. I think, is there any kind of academic model that can help me get even more points? And I, I've got a kind of roughish plan. And then I read the requirement one more time. Because often that first reading, my brain being hijacked by cortisol could have been playing tricks on me. But the fact that they then go back for a third time, and you might think, oh, I haven't got time for that. Okay, do what a lot of students do and answer completely the wrong question and get zero. That's what happens. Believe me, you know, I've been involved with the examining team, you know, for 20 odd years. And that's what happens. Yeah. So far better to take a breath. Is that plan answering what I just read for the third time? It is. Let's move off. Yeah. Too many people jump in feet first and just like go down the wrong road and then you really are dead uh technical knowledge well there's no excuse for that really you need to have had you know everyone takes different amounts of time but even for the next week or so you need to have a timetable not of study i would say a timetable of living and what i mean by that is you are very clear with regards to when you get up when you go to bed uh, food you eat Exercise, a good way of getting rid of cortisol out of your body is uh, exercise. Well, because exercise produces endorphins. Endorphins are the perfect antidote to cortisol. If you are getting stressed, learn breathing techniques. There's, you know, there's different breathing techniques which will slow your heart rate down and make you be able to perform better. All of that should be in a diary so it gets done. Yep. Commercial acumen. Just commercial acumen is about, you know, would you put a um, 100 grand kitchen in a 40 grand flat? You wouldn't. But if I'm living in a 10 million pound penthouse, I probably would put, you know, a 200,000 pound kitchen in because that would be the appropriate. Would you put 5,000 pound alloy wheels on your 1,000 pound car? You'd be an idiot. But, you know, so commercial acumen is, is making the right commercial decisions. Picture it, as I've just done. Don't include irrelevant content. Yep. Only reading half of the question. That's the rule of and, because it often says blah, 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 and. And people miss out the next bit because of often cortisol. So that is a summary of what people have done badly and have improved upon when they've been going through courses with me. That's also a summary of what students have done in real exams as a result of examiner meetings and, you know, working with, with the various ACCA teams. So hopefully that's useful. I'm going to stop sharing actually, and I'm going to come back on camera. I don't know whether it's taking me off camera or not, just so I can see you. Uh, but do you have any questions on what I've said there or anything you'd like me to make more clarity on? There's a couple of things come through the chat box. Let me have a look. The, the session, how long is it going to be? It's going to be, well, at least an hour. Uh, I mean, it depends on how many questions you ask. But there's a recording. Do you have to go to bed? Is it good to have their own academy? Well, it brings in players you don't have to buy. That's the benefit of an academy. Uh, an academy is basically a, a juniors club where we, we train and develop and nurture young talent, which hopefully become, you know, superstar footballers. So Manchester United sold David Beckham for uh, millions and millions of pounds. Uh, David Beckham cost Manchester United nothing because he, he played for them since he's 12 years old. So that's why you have an academy. Uh, I don't think you can see the chat. 
yeah, I mean, that's right. That's what. Well, that's why I said ask questions. But I'm having a quick look there now. Okay. Any any questions you want to come off chat before we uh, close it down? So just one question. Um, it, it seems like from your uh, explaining that you would rather spend if they had if there is any investment rather spend money on marketing than doing the stadium improvement or no, stuff no, like that. No, no. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. I just said you need to have awareness that, yeah, there is quite a bit of income from match day. It's, it's yeah. big. It's the second or third. If you combine it with retail income, it's almost the same as television. But yeah. uh, television is massive and you might want to, you know, not neglect the television. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So thank you. Uh, anything else before we... We bring things to a close. Thank you. Uh, hi, John. Okay, go on. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, so from the board structure, right? There is no HR because all the each function is responsible for recruiting and appraising its own stuff, right? So what your what your thought about having? A yeah, I think it's good. I mean. HR, it so what the, the board is a bit messy. I mean, they've got marketing and IT under the same responsibility. Yeah, yeah, There's yeah. There's no yeah, HR. Correct. I mean, it's a bit rubbish. Yes, I agree. And I think you would maybe have a more professional management team. You know, it's good to have someone specialist in IT. Someone's, and, and I think because the marketing and IT person is probably the same, they don't understand IT. You know, HR is quite specialist with the aspects of employment law and things like that. So, yeah, I think I think that's missing. But it's a family business. You see, if it was a PLC, uh, yeah, yeah. if it was owned by yeah. shareholders, they wouldn't be allowed to operate like that. The non-executive directors wouldn't tolerate it because you're not going to get a well-run business if you don't have a professional functional management team, which it does not appear that they have. So good question. Yes, thank you. So do you think that the, the family business would conflict with the operational side, which which really need HR, but the family family business right as you say family business doesn't really care about it so um yeah well well yeah i mean it, they should have hr but if they don't have it the family are at risk of not making as much money as they could have had they had professional hr managers mm, okay thank you so what about what about talent talent acquisition or talent management for the young youngster for uh the academy right so well, that could be talent, yeah. Talent management, yeah, it could could be. I mean, talent management is not normally used in the context of football, but it might be worth thinking about it. I mean, talent management is making sure that the people that can make a big difference to your business, doesn't have to be a football business, are, are stretched and challenged because most people who are considered talent like to be stretched and challenged and given lots of training, lots of help, lots of opportunity. So... In football, if a football player who's a superstar footballer, Manchester City have this. They have lots and lots of players that they've bought because they've got a lot of money from Qatar or Abu Dhabi. I get mixed up. But they, you know, they lose some players. There's a guy left and went to play for Chelsea. I've forgotten his name now, but uh, he wasn't getting enough games at Manchester City because Manchester City have so much talent that the talent, there's only 11 people to be picked so yeah that's a it's an interesting point you make there Nia. thank you Sean. Uh, excuse me is there is there any way we can access your mocks well they all sold out unfortunately abdul so they were they I, I put various mocks and they they sell out so that's a kind of separate product really i mean i can tell you the things i put in my mock i i did something on evaluation i wrote you know a whole exam on it yeah Okay. So that's, that's, that's so they, they're all, you know, I get, I get ACCA SBL markers to mark them. So it's kind of, it's done as a, as a whole product. You know, we, 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 we kind of write an exam, we mark it, we do zoom reviews, but you know, people, people, I have to pay ACCA markers to mark it and pay to get on the platform. And, and, you know, it, it's a, it's a considerable investment of time and, and effort and money. So it, it's, yeah, okay. that's, that's something people buy. Okay, thank you. No yeah, problem. okay. I have a look at my YouTube channel. There's, there's stuff from previous years, which basically has uh, similar 
principles applied to different questions. It's important that you understand the principles. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All righty. So what, what are we going to do for the next uh, 10 days or, or, or so? We're going to keep cool. We're going to kind of keep the knowledge warm. We're going to reflect, but we're not going to go crazy. We're not going to run a marathon every night before our marathon on the Tuesday. So we're not going to run a marathon Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night, Monday night, just before we go and run the real marathon on Tuesday. You look after your brain. Yeah, it needs sleep. It needs nutrition. Keep calm. And remember, passing this exam, it's going to be fantastic. It's going to change your life. I mean, some people pay to do my mock and they had something more important came up. Gosh, when I was studying for exams, there was nothing more important to me than passing. And if you haven't got fire in your belly telling you what this is going to bring to you, try and find it even with 10 days to go, because that's going to drag you and make you, you know, in the exam, what else can I say? What, how can I get more marks? I'm not going to leave this question blank. Whereas people that don't seem to have that belly, fire in their belly, just, I don't know. So, yeah, get get some fire in your belly. Keep your just eye on five the prize. Days to go. Sorry? Just five days to go, not, not ten days. Yes, it's the, the, the seventh, isn't it? So, yeah, more than five days. Isn't it's, it? it's, it's next seven, Tuesday. Right? What day are we on today? Anyway, uh, you know that, we know the date. We know the date. It's next Tuesday. Um, so, yeah, get yourself sorted for the next few days. Okay. Can I ask one very quick question? Oh, go on. Um, the in, If you're asked to write a report for the board, would you generally put an introduction and a conclusion in it, or is that wasting time, like, in every case? Very briefly, very briefly, but don't over-elaborate it. Yeah. So, okay. yeah, it would be appropriate to from date, maybe an intro or maybe a conclusion, but there tends to be not a lot of marks in the marking scheme for that. So, you know, be be fairly light touching on that. Yeah. yeah. The marks are for the content that you're putting in. That's I where think the it was one of the ACCA debriefs. It did say, oh, it was, you needed to put this and this in. And it was quite lengthy, but I, I appreciate their debriefs are a bit lengthier than they normally uh, they Well, they, they have, they're of a tutorial nature often. They are not representative of what would be expected of a student if you're reading the small print sometimes. So, yeah, just just be careful. They're massive, some of those answers, and they go down all kinds of rabbit holes. Um, you need to get 50 or more in the exam. Be careful on over-elaborate presentation. It does eat into your time. But obviously, you do report. Conclusion, there is sometimes in the marking scheme mark allocation for conclusions. So there's there's no harm in doing it if it if it's deemed professional and appropriate to include. Thank you. No problem. No problem. Okay, guys, if you join late or you had to leave, uh, I will, it will take a little bit of time for this to be rendered and then I'll, I will put this on to my YouTube channel so you can see it. Thanks for your questions. Be relaxed. If you can't answer something in the exam, always fall back on, what would I do in the workplace? What would I say in the workplace? Because that is what the essence of the exam is. It's a practical work-based exam where you are asked to behave as a strategic leader, showing your knowledge in areas of technology, corporate governance, leadership, control, and so on. So always fall back on that. A lot of people don't realize that, you know, things you would say in the workplace that you know are just as important as what's in a, a Kaplan textbook. Okay, good luck. And thanks for listening. And all Thank the very you, best. Sean. Thank no you. Problem. Thank you so much for your touch, Ron. It's all right, Noah.